So here's our uh, theorem of uh, li uh, fundamental theorem of line integrals again. It is computed like this: n value and beginning value. And this is our new result. Let's pay attention to this. Let's read this one. Is a vector field, right? But defined on a region. So it is suggesting this vector field sometimes is not defined at one point. For example, if my vector field is like this, 1 over x, i, 1 over y, j. Do you see several points in xy plane such that this vector field is not defined? How many points are there? Infinitely many points at all the things that x equals 0, which is this vertical line, right? All the thing y equals zero. This is a horizontal line. Everywhere on this axis, this vector field is not defined, right? But where is it defined? You know, strict interior region of the first quadrant, the phi is defined. The second quadrant, strict interior region of this phi. Uh, in the second quadrant, this vector field phi is defined, and so on. So that's what they're talking about. Region D. So this is like region D. Usually we mean a region is a connected region. Is this region first quadrant and the second quadrant is connected? No, it is separated by this one and this function is not defined in there. So usually we mean is a connected region, so it, it, within the first region. So our curves and everything is taking place in the first region. Forget about second and third and fourth quadrant, that we are just living in this first region, then the vector field is defined in that region. Conservative means just conservative in that region first quadrant, right? So all the points and curve we talk about is within that region. We don't go start in here and travel to the second quadrant and come back, nothing like that. Just stay everything within that first quadrant. That's what they mean by region D. It's conservative on that region D, right? That's what they mean. Then there is a function f such that that function, uh, the vector field, is a gradient of vector field, right? What we had before is that if it is a gradient vector field, it's conservative, right? But the legit question was raised by one of our, our classmates is that can there be some conservative vector field out there the human race have not discovered yet, but it happened to be not gradient vector field? Is it possible? And what this theorem says? It's not possible. It's not going to be millions of generations down the road. They're not going to be find a conservative vector field that is not gradient vector field. Right? Such a statement is possible in mathematics. All right. So let's summarize it. Path independence is how we started, right? Very strange property. Who would have guessed it is path independence? And physics is called it's a conservative, right? Same thing. In that region, D, and it's reformulated for convenience. It's nice formulation, something equals zero. It's a mathematical formula for all closed curve, right? Then here's a new thing, equivalence. Before, if it is a gradient vector field, then is path independent, conservative. They're saying everything that like this is already gradient vector field. And that gradient vector field, um, that scalar function is called potential function for the vector field. All right. So, one thing I have to address it is it's a bit abstract because it's a gradient. In our example, here is the vector field. Show is a conservative. All you have to do is just go ahead and figure out what f is, right? So there is no other example, so you don't have to worry about that. But in this generality, I have to explain the given a vector field. How do we actually uh, go about and formulate this f abstractly? If it is concretely given, what do you do? You integrate, right? Integrate here and there, and then it will give you the answer because you know how it works. But this is fundamental result. We have to explain that that integral works. In general, it turns out, computing that, you know, um, I component, J component, integrate, the theoretically, you cannot easily guarantee that um, this integral will work, X integral and Y integral. So there is difficulty of integrating abstractly. It's difficult to guarantee that the integral will work. And you will see the example, the integral actually doesn't work. So it's a bit strange. But here's their idea. This is the region D, for example, like first quadrant. 
you choose a one point, a fixed one point, like x0, y0. And we want to define this function, scalar function, at this arbitrary point x and y. So what is our f of x, y? You have to define that first and show that it's partial, agrees with the x component of phi, partial of y, agrees with the x component of y. This is the first thing we have to do. Go ahead and describe that function abstractly. So what is it? If we have a vector field like that, nothing is specifically given. Here's their idea. Because it's a connected region, you start from the base point, go to that region, the point, uh, however you want. If there's an obstacle, if there's undefined in here, you have to go around, right? In the first quadrant, of course, you don't have to go around. You go straight, right? But however you go, go this way or that way, you know it's a path independence because it's a conservative, right? We assume it's a conservative. And this is going and that going. All the values are the same. So you define it like this, path integral, line integral over C1 and over C2. They're all the same thing. It doesn't change. It's a common value no matter how you arrive to the xy point. So they define it like this. Choose any path starting from this fixed point to your target point xy and line integral to the line integral. That value will remain common for whatever path you choose. The common value is our definition of f of xy. Once you define it like this and doing the partial derivative analysis, and you can show uh, x component is um, fx is x component of that, fy is y component of that, you can show that. So I'll leave it at that. It takes a little bit, of, a little bit longer. But in general, I mean, in practice, for example, you will never do this. You will actually, how is an example? You actually integrate and uh, for compute examples, right? So you, you actually don't use this one for, but for those who are interested in how do you abstractly approach, this is the beginning. All right? So now you know conservative means gradient, right? It's the same thing now on, uh, on the region. It's defined. So here's another challenge for you. This is XYZ space. We have a vector field. Is this vector field defined everywhere? It says no. Why does that point to the vector field is not defined? The origin 0, 0, 0, which is in bold face like this, means vector 0, so 0, 0, 0. Because there's a denominator in there, the length of the vector. What is the length of this vector here? 0. So this is undefined, right? So this vector field is not defined at 0. So what kind of region are we looking at? All xy plane except missing 0, 0, 0. Not xy plane. xyz space, right? All this three-dimensional reason except that one, this vector value is well defined. We want to show this is conservative in that vector field. All right? It's written like this, this very compact way, but what it really means is that XYZ, what is the formula for um, length of a vector R? Square root of X squared plus Y squared plus Z squared, right? So that's a scalar or vector, whole thing. It's a scalar multiple to what vector? X, Y, Z. That's a position there, right? Okay, make sense? Now, if you multiply this one to the one component, multiply to that, multiply, that's X component, Y component, Z component of this vector field. What is the task? To show it's a conservative vector field, right? Any idea how to show this one? Yeah. Find this potential function, right? By integrating. That's your exercise, number two. But it's a three components, right? Integrate with respect to x first. And bring in the constant that depends on y and z. Right? Things like that.
So I finished computing um, integral with respect to x of the first component, fx, which is this one, and treating y and z constant. Think about it like putting a number 1, 1 there. How are you going to integrate this one? And you made our, oh, that's a u substitution, right? So if you make a u substitution treating this y squared plus c squared constant, then it's a 2x, it's a reciprocal, and it becomes something that you can easily integrate. But when you actually integrate, you have to throw in the constant, right? Here's a relative constant, may involve y and z. If it involves y and z, when you take the derivative with respect to x, that becomes zero, right? So you have to throw in two variables this time to be perfectly logical. So we have that, it must be in that shape. By differentiating this, sec uh, this first term, with respect to y and z, you immediately realize that that's exactly y component and the z component, right? And therefore you throw in, oh, that must be just simply zero or absolute constant. But if it's more complicated, and if you realize, oh, this derivative with respect to y and z is not exactly this and that, and then we have to fiddle with this one to adjust that, at the end of the day, maybe it's still not possible, then you can conclude that not gradient, not conservative, but it works actually. All right? So try to take this as f of x, y, and compare that with f, y, and see what conclusion you have for this one, phi of y, z. Y, z. Continue on that one. So here I take this ex um, formula that come from the first component, then I differentiate it with respect to y, and I use this shortcut of a derivative of root x, which is 1 divided by 2 times root x. So it's 1 divided by 2 times root x. You have to multiply derivative inside with respect to y, which is 2y here, right? So the derivative of this one with respect to y, after you cancel 2, agrees exactly with what you see in that second component. So you conclude this must be 0. So here it must be 0 in there, right? So if you differentiate with respect to y is a 0, it means there's no y in it. That's what it means, right? So this function originally supposed to be two variable function. Now we conclude it's actually one variable function, phi z. No y in it. And then you deal with the third one. So this is our formula 
with this one actually one variable if you do the partial derivative with respect to z of this one similar show them for the first time matchup second one is no longer partial derivative there's only one variable in it differentiated with respect to z is just simply phi prime z in this time and that must be zero therefore you conclude it's a constant all right So we conclude that function must be this one. So if you t t you know take the gradient vector field of this one, that matches exactly that guy right here. You can verify that. And if you just have to choose one potential function, just choose zero in there. That's a simple enough. Do you have a question? Right. Let's think about it in terms of polynomial. If, if it is uh, in terms of polynomial, if you have y and z, the parts in it, right? If there is a part y, y part in it, that means you have some sort of power that is greater than 1, right? Um, and if, if, it is, if it is y to the first, you have some coefficient that might involve the z. If you differentiate this one, you will have some coefficient in front of it, right? So you're not going to have 0 in it. If it's y to the second, then if you differentiate it, you will have some y in it in there, right? So if the sum derivative is zero, this means it's a constant. That's one way to say it. If the derivative is zero, then that means it's a constant, right? Function, correct? Yeah. So here, constant means uh, it does not have um, constant means either involve x or z because we're doing it with respect to y, right? Derivative with respect to y becoming zero means it's a constant function, but constant relative to x and z, the other two variables. But we already know there's no x in it, right? It must be just a z in it. So that's why we can conclude y phi z only has a z in it. Because derivative of 0 means constant. Here, constant means in terms of the other two variables. Make sense? OK. Anything else? So this is a problem from the book, and we're ready for this one, since we practiced that one there. We'll take a little bit of a shortcut. You don't have to do all the way the integral. If the first candidate gives you a good idea, oh, this works actually, let's go for it. Um, so, But let's uh, read this one first. Calculate the work done. So we're calculating what kind? The, the line integral of a vector field, right? And moving the mass m from distance r1 to r2 under that if I you know artificially moved it like this we're just talking about the work done by um, the force f just the separated part right if I move this one along like this or if it is a free fall however if I you know toss it like that with this initial velocity the gravity pulls down does it move around like this arrive it there it's possible so either it's a free fall or not you can think about the separate uh, work done by this gravitational force so that's the force field and here little r means the length of vector r so we just um, practice that and this one while this moving things around never changes right the mass of the the big one and the mass of the little one, so we can treat this one as just a constant k that never changes. So the force field here really looks like constant k divided by length of a vector raised to what power? Third power, right? Multiply by the vector r, position vector, right? This is the real universal gravitation, the law of universal gravitation, right? So now we're realizing this one as what? How do you solve this problem? How do you calculate the work? Yeah, use a gradient vector field. If it is a conservative vector field, right? Then if you have a gradient vector field, you have the fundamental theorem of line integrals. Fb minus Fa, right? If it is A here, if it is B there. So what is the first thing we do? Compute. 
Right. The potential function. Yeah, it's exercise. Potential function for F that was described up there. Let's just stop right here and rest the part, and I'll just explain it and leave that computational part alone. So this is our thing. Go ahead and calculate the potential function. What kind of function is it? Potential function. Is that a vector function or a scalar function? Potential function I'm talking about. It's a scalar function whose gradient vector field is exactly this guy, right? That what, that's what we just did, the earlier exercise. I gave you a vector field. You computed the scalar function called potential function whose gradient vector field is the given vector field, right? So how does this start? This is exercise number three, is that right? We first write down the vector field in terms of x, y, z, right? How does that look like? You see the scalars multiplied at each of the component? What is the component here? Is x, right? x multiplied by k times denominator, length of a vector, x squared plus y squared plus z squared raised to third power, y component, the same denominator, third power, k times y component multiplied by that scalar, and z component, the same scalar multiplied to that z component divided by the same scalar down there, third power. Negative, thank you. It's all negative there. Fair enough? Then you have to solve this one, integrate with respect to x, right? And then you know, quickly solve it because it's going to it's very similar to what we just did. By just integrating one time, you realize that, oh, that works for y and z, so I can choose that phi of y, z quickly rather than uh, approach the, the way I did.
So I just finished the, um, doing the X part and be able to um, pull out like this. So agree on the integration part on U up to here? Right? So if there's any part that is only consistent with Y and Z, if you do the derivative with respect to X, that would be zero. So that's the constant version when you do iterated integral for X in a multiple version. Okay, so if you use substituted back, you was this one, right? So it looks like that. And you have to do the same thing with Y and Z and then realize that um, this is actually absolute constant, just like we did it before. This part just completely take care of remaining component. So you don't have to fiddle with this part. It's absolute constant. This is a potential energy function for the gravit the universal gravitation field. Right? This is really advanced version of understanding gravitational force through this potential energy function, which is derived like this. Do you have a question, sir? Oh yeah, yeah. Kx should be there. Sorry about that. And then you multiply and x cancel. Thank you. Yes. Anything else? All right. Now you have potential energy function. You can you can also derive it like this. Describe it. Um, this this is actually what is a better notation vector notation for this one. This is length of a vector, right? Like that. So you can write it actually like this. The potential energy function for the universal gravitation is that position vector is simply that constant, gravitational constant, divided by the length of the vector. This is the potential energy function. If you take the gradient of this one, you get the universal gravitation force field. Right? So all that matters here is the position, right? Not exactly what x and y and z are. So if you do that integral from along that C path over there, the universal gravitation, dr, what does the fundamental theorem of line integral says? This is Fb minus Fa, right? So what is Fb here? Gkm, not k, gmm, divided by the length of the position of the terminal point minus... Should call R of B maybe, and this GMM divided by length of the position at the beginning, right? And if you read the question, they didn't specify what this position is, but their distance is a distance from the center of mass of the big M, R1, center of the mass of big um, uh, big M is R2, so this is R1 and R2, so this is by their notation is sim uh, simply this one divided by R2 minus R1. So that's the answer. They didn't give you the full information, but that's all that matters in that computation. Just like the kinetic energy calculation, all that matters is the terminal velocity and actually the speed. And that's a similar phenomenon here. All right? It's because of the fundamental theorem of calculus is all about the terminal points in there. But again, if you try to wrap your head around, try to understand physically how this works, you know, calculus is called simple, but it's hard to understand. This path independence itself is not easy to understand why it is so, physically. All right, that was some technical exercise. So here's another theorem I have.